Jesse Macopoulos, thank you so much for being on Flute Unscripted. Hi, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're really excited to have you here. You're a friend of Flute Centers. Uh, we carry your uh, books and we've been working with you for a long time and working with your students. So it's great to kind of talk with you in this capacity too. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So I wanted to um, kind of learn a little bit more about where your passion comes from for the flute. Uh, I think anyone can tell when they see you perform and when they talk to you that you're just so passionate about performing and the arts. Um, and you started the flute when you were about 11 and you say that you just knew kind of right away. You saw the shiny flute and you said, this is it. I'm going to play this instrument and I'm going to dedicate my life to it. Um, that's kind of a big thing for an 11 year old. So uh, I'm wondering if over the years, if you've had any second doubts, um, second thoughts, and if you thought, you know, maybe your 11 year old self could have learned a thing or two, and if you had some other things you might have thought about following instead of the flute. Yeah, that, that's such a great um, perspective on that question, because I get off, asked often, you know, how did you start the flute? When did you know? Um, but the way you frame the question is really um, kind of exciting because when you're 11, you do have a vision for something if you're lucky enough to be 11 and have a vision. So first I would say like being older now and having raised two kids, I realized, I realized now how unusual it is for an 11 year old to actually become incredibly passionate about something and decide they just want to like dedicate their life to it, right? Their life. What does that even mean at the age of 11, right. you know? Um, and so first, I, I just want to say that I'm grateful that that something just captured my heart and my, my focus and my passion and that it was the flute. And the way it happened was I was at a concert and I was up on, um, on the balcony and I looked down and there were all these flutes in the front row and then other instruments. And I didn't know what the instrument was. I didn't know what it sounded like. All I knew was that it was shiny because I could see like lights darting back and forth across the instrument as it, they were playing and it was glistening and I, I was really into bling even back then you know <laughs> so um so yeah I was really actually visually attracted to the instrument and then for my birthday that year somebody gave me a James Galway record and um you know how many flutists have been born how much how many passions for flute have been uh, born because of his recordings um and when I heard what the flute could do I was like, wow, I, that is what I want to do. So it was at that point that like the sound of the instrument and potentially not just the sound of the instrument, but like the challenge. I mean, when, when you hear somebody play so fast that it sounds like two flutes yeah. and you're 11 and all you're hearing in, in your little band group of flute learners is poo poo, like these sounds, <laughs> it's like, wow, that's the potential of the instrument. So I think really what struck my passion was like, um, this, I think really just a passion for like investigation and exploration and excelling and um, beauty and uh, something that captures the heart. And so um, to answer your question more fully then, you know, at that age, I didn't know what that meant. For me, that just meant practice and get better and explore and understand what the capabilities of this instrument was. And of course, back then, nobody was doing extended techniques, really. Right. Um, you know, there weren't the, there wasn't beatboxing for the flute. I mean, there's Jethro Tull, but like that was a whole different genre. And so now so much has changed in the flute field in terms of what the instrument does. And um, and I've just taken that even further into flute and dance and submerging flutes underwater and playing flutes on top of mountains. And, um, you know, so I think in the end, it isn't just the flute that captured my passion. Looking back, I realized that um, I, I think really I'm a creator. I'm not just a flutist and I'm not just a musician. And I've kind of come to terms with um, my journey has sort of been involved, has involved like coming to terms with a better understanding of what is my essence. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm adventuresome. Um, I'm, I'm a creator. I like to investigate. I like to achieve. I like to conquer and destroy. <laughs> And, yeah. well, and speaking of all those things, I mean, you, you are an artist as well, and your artwork is right behind you at the moment. Um, do you sometimes feel like it is a little bit more satisfying to have these other outlets to work through? Um, I mean, even with art, it's something tangible. It's a product you can kind of look back on and, and reflect on. And with music, it's fleeting. Um, you play the performance and it's done. 
true. You know, um, there is something really satisfying. Well, the, 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 in the music, you have a CD recording and that's like your version of a painting because it's, it's there to be played again. And, um, you know, you can like look back on your work, just like you look back on a painting, you're like, wow, I did that five years ago and I can see where I was in my headspace back then. I see the choices I was making with color and I see what I was exploring in terms of element elements and the medium. And the same thing happens with a CD recording, but in live performance, like you're saying, it is fleeting. Like there, there is nothing that just kind of captures and solidifies it and keeps it static. Um, and maybe, maybe visual art is not static either. Maybe every time you look at a painting, you see something different, mm -hmm. but there is a kind of a sense of more, there's something more gratifying about, I think in some ways creating a painting and having it be completed and, um, knowing that it's sort of uh, like static in some ways. Um, and with performance, you know, you, it goes two ways. You can have a performance you don't like, and you're like, woo, I'm Thank glad God, that that's done. done. Yeah. Yeah. Glad nobody videoed that, right? Yeah. Or you can have performances where you're, you know, but the difference is like in the act of performing, you are really engaging with a very powerful dynamic energy field. And that's not just coming out of you and not coming through you and not coming through your instrument, but it actually comes back at you from the people in the hall. So the, the experience of creating with sound in that moment and the experience of being a channel for, um, you know, that dynamic energy is just so, so unique and par powerful that it could never be captured. And so that's what you miss with painting or filmmaking, you know, but yeah. so they're both they have their pros and cons <laughs> and is that Absolutely. is that where you think um like multimedia performances kind of bridge the gap it's a nice um you know interactive performance that engages the audience and sometimes has visual aspects as well um is that i mean you you're very into multimedia collaborations um do you feel like those experiences offer the audience something a little bit more special yeah i get i love these questions they're great so um you know, that is what's unique about multimedia, um, you know, or performance art. And so, for example, because you're creating the piece of art in advance, like this project I'm working on, the hydrology project, which as there, I'm already into a year and a half of it at this point. Um, and so there's this process of create creation and exploration and learning how to like work with the medium, you know, in this case, it's water and fabric and then music and editing and film. And then, so you're, you're doing something that is in a sense done when it's done like a painting, but then you bring it into the performance space. And so now that thing becomes a thing that is another medium or another tool for this dynamic energy that I was talking about. So then that goes up on the screen and then you're performing your flute and then you're touching the audience and you're drawing them in and there's a sort of dynamic energy. And if you're dealing with um, dance or, or dancers on stage with you or other kinds of um, performing arts that are happening at the same time, um, then you're like, boof, you've just got everything. And so, yeah, I would say that's probably the reason I've just been like sucked into this world of, you know, inner um, multimedia and just kind of interdisciplinary exploration and performance. Can you tell us more about the hydrology project? Sure, it, it started during COVID. So when everybody was isolating and doing the six feet apart, I was doing the six feet down, 16 feet down under in the pool. I was like, well, <laughs> I'll surround myself by water, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm being kind of funny with that. That's not really, that wasn't the thought behind it. But basically, um, I think that we, we come into seasons in our life. Um, looking back, I can see distinct seasons of, you know, seasons of growth and seasons of um, things that you become interested in, the types of friends you'd like to hang out with and all these different things. And for some reason, I don't know what it was, but I'm like in a major water season of my life. So I started... Um, getting involved in whitewater, um, kayaking, uh, like a year, like se officially 17 months ago, I think is my like official birthday of when I just decided to dedicate myself to it. And I live in West Virginia, which is like whitewater capital yeah. area region of the world. And I've lived here for 12 years and I didn't know that and didn't really engage in that, um, until this, this sort of like 
awakening happened in my life. And so I'm surrounded by water and I'm surrounded by the power of water and I'm surrounded by like water mentors, people teaching me how to read the river, you know, mountains and canyons and wind and all of these elements. And I'm like thinking, this is so much like flute playing, like the way we funnel the air, the way we like create the, you know, increase the velocity of the airstream, the way we um, navigate the phrases is so much like reading water and the choices we make and, and the, you know, when you have runs and things that are really technically difficult, they're like crux moves in a, in a rapid sequence. And so I'm having these experiences and I'm thinking, wow, this is so much like flute playing and I'm bringing it into my teaching and bringing it into my practice. And then I just kind of had this idea of getting in the pool and starting to explore movement underwater. And it just kind of emerged into, well, what, I wonder what happens if I put my flute underwater. And of course, it's not my good flute. Right. But I do that. <laughs> well, I bet a lot of people might uh, not know that, that you have stunt flutes, right? That you use for all your adventures <laughs> underwater and, and outdoors. So do, would you say that underwater is probably the most peculiar place you've taken a stunt flute? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. What's really funny about um, that flute, and I love how you're calling it stunt flutes, <laughs> Um, but what's, what's funny about that flute is, so um, I don't know if you saw the post where I submerged it and was playing and the bubbles were coming out, like yeah, the year that I posted it last year, but I think it got like, um, what, like 18,000 views in one day and like 4,000 comments and like people were upset, you know, why is she putting a flute under the water? Who could do that to a flute? And other people thought it was cool and people had questions. And so the, the interesting thing about that flute is I actually picked it up out of a dumpster. Our music school had, um, we're, we're getting rid of like flutes from the 60s and 70s that were just completely, it wouldn't make sense to repair them. And they were instruments that like they had used for music education majors. And I collected four of them and I was gonna run them over with my car and take them apart, run them over, and flatten them. And Talk about people like, being upset about seeing a flute yeah. underwater. That would just trigger them in a whole other way. Yeah, yeah, that's like, yeah, right. So, but, you know, they didn't play. And I'm like, right. it's art, right? So I thought yeah. I'd run it over the car, and I would create these this beautiful, like, um, Caldwell kind of, like, mobile with flute parts, like, just kind of mobile. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Can't you see it, like, right there in my living room? And so, um, but when I decided to submerge the flute, I, I did. And the, the irony is that when I pulled it out of the water, it worked <laughs> because, because the pads had gotten swollen and sealed. Right. And so, so I was like actually able to play this flute oh, that I was- New repair technique right there. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so yeah. Water, water's unique. And I've played, um, you know, like I did a 500 foot climb up the mace in, Sedona, Arizona. And that was kind of crazy because when we got to the top, the, the mileage was 50 miles per hour. And it was, wow. you know, it almost blew my case off the top of the, the summit. And I had to like hold, we had to hold everything down and lie flat. And, um, you know, in, in all of these instances, you know, it's just like, you can't play normally because the wind pull, will pull your, your air away. Yeah. And this morning I posted a paragliding um, video of me parafluting. So mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. 8,000 feet up in the air over the Julian Alps in Slovenia in a, you know, paragliding with the flute. That was amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm also curious about the, this is the fun side of it, the, the product of all this interesting work um, and the creative process. But what about the not so glamorous side, um, getting funding for all of these projects and getting uh, the practicalities of, of having them work. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because you've been the recipient of a number of, of grants and awards that I think have given you um, the chance to explore a lot of these projects. Yeah, absolutely. So grant writing is like a beast. It's like an animal. It's like a whole, like, I mean, I'm not even sure where to start with grant writing. So I guess I'll just say that like, it is like a, an art form or a science of its own. And, you know, the keys to really successful, uh, you know, proposals are basically to make what you're doing clear and it's outcome clear and it's benefit clear. And that's really hard to do when you're dealing with something that's just so kind of wild and out there. Like, how are you gonna get funded for bringing your flute underwater? 
you right. know so how do you how do you like take these creative ideas and then like um make it make the outcomes the processes and the benefits of it clear and then pitch it in a way that um you know is a winning proposal so i think one of the uh, one of the coolest biggest grants that i won the first time was the aaron copeland fund for new music recording and that project was um 35 com compositions by women composers um all and american women composers all based on literature and so you know it was like a winner because uh, i was going to put out the cd and it was going to uh you know hit a large population of a predominantly underserved prop population at least at that time and you know now it's becoming a little different um this was like the early 2000s and and it was integrative in nature you know it, it crossed boundaries and so of course it would win and so that's that's the other part of it is like how do you then craft it um and so with the hydrology project i think one of the things i'm looking at doing is actually um bringing um microphones underwater and collecting the sounds from the instrument as it because it actually makes sound underwater it's fascinating oh interesting you know it's, yeah yeah as you as you switch the length of the tube um, the, the bubbles, if you're blowing through it, like actually have pitch and uh, using the, the sound files to create like electronic music and an electronic installation with the water sounds and the flute sounds combined with the, the, yeah. So it's just like, you know, uh, on the other hand, I'm not always really caring about grant stuff. A lot of it is, you know, self-funded yep. or you work with collaborators who are willing to work for free, just like you are in your you're just in it together having fun right like equally passionate about about the the end result um and something else i'm interested about with you specifically is your experience with synesthesia um i heard that you have that is that correct and can you talk about how that affects your music making your art and your life and maybe explain it a little bit for anybody that's not quite sure what that means yeah so i i also didn't know what synesthesia was until somehow i read about it or I was talking to someone and they were like, well, you, you have synesthesia, you know, and I'm like, what's that? So basically um, synesthesia is where you experience one sense through another sense. So for example, some people might taste words like, or they hear a sound and the sound evokes a sense of taste or it evokes a sense of smell. I knew a poet um, who I collaborated with on a project and her synesthesia was that words evoked um, like smells and tastes for her. Wow. And I mean, we can all say that if we, you know, bite into an orange and maybe you can sort of remember the scent of an orange, but for her it was word, you know, just like the word gravel would evoke, you know, certain kinds of uh, tastes or smells. And for me, my synesthesia is that when I hear sound, I hear color. So, um, and I can turn it on and off. I can hear sound just like a, as a plain old kind of sound, you know, flute sound or a train sound. And I, my brain is able to just distinguish and kind of categorize it as what it is. Um, but if I put myself in a space where I want to experience the sound as a color, or sometimes it just washes over me and, and the sound is just complete color, then, um, then that's what I experience. I can hear sound and color. And so one of my biggest passions, um, and it comes from studying with Peter Lloyd at first, because he talked a lot about creating color with sound. And then Paul Meisen did as well. But, uh, you know, one of my passions in flute playing is actually timbre and like really going into like how you can take an A and play it like 59 different ways. Yeah. Um, and how you alter the sound and combine the sound and the colors to create your composition. Um, and so you know that's sort of like how i've always been interested and then i learned about the synesthesia in my paintings what i've done um i have a series of paintings that are actually based off of synesthetic experiences where um and they're on my website if people want to um listen to them where when i had them in the gallery um i actually had a cd player in front of each painting and the people could listen to the piece of music that i created the painting out of and that evoked uh colors that then ended up on the canvas it's a fun thing to have i really like yeah. being weird <laughs> <laughs> well and it probably i think it works its way down in some way to your students as well do you involve them in in any of this yeah i mean the wv flute studio is like 
already kind of known for, you know, uh, being adventuresome and uh, certainly with our traditional playing and all the standard repertoire that we do, you know, there's a lot of discussion about um, color and timbre and like crafting the phrasing from a visual art perspective, just because that is just so inbuilt in my language and the way I teach and the way I work, you know, understanding texture, line, form, dimension, and applying all that to sound, even if it's written on a piece of paper, you're still moving into that space, recreating uh, like the vision of the composer, maybe even really recreating it in a lot of ways by bringing your own artistic vision and voice uh, to it and, and working with these elements of art in a way that aren't typically talked about in the flute world, but are very typically discussed in the visual art world yeah. and also in dance. And um, so we do traditional stuff and we do um, sort of approach everything from with this vocabulary and this understanding and this language and the students actually will look up artwork. I have art books in the studio. I have paintings hanging up. We discuss it. We apply it to music. Um, in terms of like movement and other things, uh, you know, we have freshmen, sophomores, grad students moving, I mean, creating works that are choreographed. Um, you can check our Facebook page out. There's some there. Um, and it's a challenge for all of them. You know, it's about digging into your shadow side. It's not everybody wants to move with the flute, you know, yeah. but they're brave, they're courageous. And what comes out of it is just inspiring and wonderful. Um, you know, and it's great to see people like branch out and it's great to be like a facilitator for that space, that sort of safe space and helping them, um, you know, find their voice and explore. Um, so it's, it's wonderful. I love it. Yeah. It seems to be kind of your, um, your like mantra as, as a teacher from what I see out of your students is inviting them to kind of find their true passion by stepping out of a comfort zone. And that that's really where that starts is that you don't have to be a, a dancer, but do something that's uncomfortable and it will lead you somewhere else. Um, do you think that kind of sets you apart from other educators and other teachers, especially at the university level? Um, I think it does. I think it is unique. Um, I think that there are many ways that teachers do that, you know, whether it's like now you will learn this harder piece. And so in that regard, I'm not unique, but I think um, I bring like sort of a spectrum to that concept of stepping into your, or out of your comfort zone. It might not just be like, you're gonna learn this hard concerto, but it might be like, and now we're gonna learn an extended technique piece, or now you're gonna compose something, or now you're going to, bring a dancer into it or now we're going to explore. And so, um, you know, sort of the, the ways that I usher in or create a space for this exploration, I think are unique um, and refreshing. And I think there are more people doing it. Um, and certainly a lot of people interested in it. And I get emails all the time from, from people all over the world. I, can you coach me? I'd like to learn how to move. I want to choreograph this. Can I have some lessons? Can like, how do you do that? You know? Yeah. So there is an interest. And I think it's going to move into being a, a little more streamlined than it is right now. I, I would imagine in 50 years, there'll be, you know, maybe, maybe 50 flutists on the planet who are actually, um, you know, like staging and moving as they perform. I think now there may be like four of us. I, I, yeah. Not that many, I also want to talk a little bit more about your book, um, The Virtuosic Flutist. Do you think when you were naming that book um, and coming up with that concept, do you think about the word virtuosic? Is that something learned? Is that something innate? Um, and is that a way that you've seen yourself? Yeah, well, that's another excellent question. I love it. So where my mind is going in terms of answering that question is like, I see, vir I see virtuosity in maybe a non-traditional kind of way. I see it as like, um, like versatility and excellence in versatility-ness. So, you know, it, virtuosity can be sort of understood as how fast can the person move their fingers and how cleanly can everything come out and how like, wow, technically amazing can something be. Um, but you can also be like virtuosic in, in your handling of the language of sound, you know, or you can be virtuosic in the way you handle color, or you can be virtuosic in your, in your versatility of like how you handle the elements of your performance. 
Um, and so I'm very like broad in the way that I see virtuosity. And I would say that, that in today's time, it's kind of not enough to just be able to like get up there and play like a, you know, amazing Paganini or something on your flute or your violin, or you really need breadth. I mean, we live, we live in a time where the, you know, the internet is a part of what we can do. We need, we really need to be entrepreneurs in the way that we handle ourselves as musicians and artists. We need to have virtuosic skills in that regard. Um, you know, what, what is our voice? What are we saying with our voice and how does that come through? You know, back like hundreds of years ago before there was all forms of entertainment that were easily accessible through radio and um, the internet, which didn't exist, you know, maybe the biggest thing to do would be to like go to the opera or go and listen to somebody play this instrument called a violin, you know, but now we're surrounded by that. So how do you, how do you kind of cut through that, all that static and, you know, create something that's unique and that touches people or that grabs them. And so I think for that's all part of uh, virtuosity. I named the book that just because I thought it was a good title, honestly. <laughs> that's <laughs> a good ring to talks it. About breath. Yeah, yeah, it talks about breath and color and like aspects of flute playing that, that I think fold into this concept of virtuosity. And then kind of like a last question for you, um, which I think comes full circle. You were talking about at the beginning the phases of your life and different stages. Um, there's all, also been different phases with the flute uh, and your relationship to it. So um, it's almost like a marriage in, it, in its own way. So what phase are the two of you in now in your life? Yeah, well, that's a very personal question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, again, um, I, I have likened my relationship to the flute as a marriage in the past, you know, and I think I've said that, like, I have a friend who said, I, I've been married to one man, but we've had eight marriages. And I'm like, yes, that's like me with my flute, except I think we've had 15 marriages, you know, <laughs> but the thing is like, even like with people, you know, you start, you, you change and you morph and, and you go through seasons and different aspects, like with the flute, like in the beginning, it's like, wow, how do you put this thing together? And oh, wow, these buttons are so cool, right? You call them buttons when you're 11 years old because you don't know they're called keys. Yeah. Right? What do the buttons do? And so you're kind of like at, in this like early phase of like awe, you know, and you wonder if it'll ever end. And, you, and I used to think like if I practice six to nine hours a day, I would become this great flutist. And I, I never understood back then that actually you, you have to maintain that. And, and so that's, that's something I'd like to talk a little bit more about as well, but, you know, basically, so you have this like beginning phase and this phase of wonder, and, and then you move into this phase of, I think for me, it was like, um, just, I think I would describe it as like this romanticism, this idea of like, I will die for my art. Yeah. I will not go out with friends. I will not say yes to that party because I'm going to have to make the sacrifice. Yes. Yes. I'm going to sacrifice for my art, you know, and become this amazing flutist, you know, and I just think of all the hours I spent in the practice room when I could have been, you know, yeah. so I have put a lot of time in and I also thought back then, you know, work hard, play hard. So yeah. then I came into this period of my life, um, probably more like 20 years ago, I was started 25 years ago, I started my college teaching career. And, and then it was like, about attaining metrics so you know tenure yep. and um you know like the things you have to do the publications the performances the so it was like okay i gotta like check all these boxes and i wanted to they were part of what i was doing anyway but it was very like work hard uh, in a different kind of way it wasn't just practicing the flute it was like creating this entire portfolio yep. and um now i would say that i'm in the season of like i like to think of it as like the queenly state, you know, where I put all this work in. And I think like eight years ago, I was like, hey, I once believed that if I worked hard in the beginning, I could then relax one day, but I've never relaxed. So yeah. now I'm in the state of just like, you know, teaching comes very naturally to me because I have so much experience with it. 
Um, I, you know, feel that there's a lot of mastery in my teaching. So I can kind of like settle into just what sort of comes out and what intuitively emerges as I listen to students and work with them and guide them in their, you know, in their professional endeavors. Um, and then there's this like, what's happening with my own flute. And frankly, you know, it gets boring, let me say, yeah. like, after so many years of Mozart and Eber and Reinecke and like all these, you know, it's just like, really? So that's where like, okay, so let's commission new music, that phase of my life. Let's, I think I've commissioned 85 uh, pieces of music and, you know, done all these world premieres. And it was like, okay, I'm going to play all this stuff that no one's ever heard before. Um, and then it moved into kind of like, you know, creating CDs. I think I have six or seven recordings out and a lot of them are new music. And now it's like, well, now what? So right. now I'm really in film and, and how can I integrate underwater and film with music and flute playing and work with other artists? So it's hard to keep it kind of, the, it doesn't stay the way it was when I was younger. I have to say like, I have no interest in really ever playing the Eber concerto again, but I pick it up and play it for fun. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. I love that. And I, I mean, you want to talk a little bit more about maintenance. Do you think that that's something, um, I wonder, you know, how you used to think of it then versus now, It almost seems like you have the perspective of putting a savings in a bank, like put in the practice hours, put them in, rack it up. And then you can kind of draw from that later. You've already done the work. Do you think that now in practice that that's working so much or are you, um, I don't know, do you have a different- it is, it is in some ways, like sometimes when I haven't practiced for a while, don't tell anybody that I do that. <laughs> um, but sometimes when that happens, sometimes um, I'll pick the flute up again and I'll be like, you know what? I'm so lucky because I have this like thing in my head. I have this amazing teacher in my head. So like I can hear something and know how to fix it. Yeah. And be like, oh, these are the things I need to adjust. But like back then I'd be playing and I wouldn't know, right? So now I can be like out of shape or doing something with a phrase. And because I'm teaching all the time and I'm working with brilliant flutists and like people who are inspiring me with their sound, I can hear like, you know, that mine might not be coming out the way I want it to, but I know immediately what to do to kind of get myself on track, including like how to get myself on track back practicing or working towards a project. I would say back in the old days, you know, up to about maybe 15 years ago, my, my model, my schema, my, my paradigm, and which is a very young paradigm was you, you must practice because as a mu musician, you just practice, you practice, yeah. you perform. You practice. And now the paradigm is more like, um, not doing that, doing a little bit of maintenance, um, stepping away from the instrument, exploring other art forms. Then when a project is ready to go, when a concert is coming up, when this is happening, boom, now I practice specifically for the event, specifically for the project. Yeah. So I'm in a completely different paradigm than I was like um, when I was, you know, 18 or 30. It's, yeah. it's a, you know, and I feel like that is the part of that queenly it's sort of like this queenly season, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's great. And um, that all makes sense to me. And I, thanks for sharing all of that. I know it is so personal to kind of talk about everyone's journey with the flute and how it changes over time. So thank you for sharing it with us. Um, and thanks for sitting down with me. It's been fascinating getting to talk with you a little bit more. Um, thank you.